Hello everyone, and for most of you, this will be a welcome to 2024. Incredible. And uh, we have one of our new arrangers here on Choir Community. This is Dan Pate from Bristol. Hi, Dan. Hi. Hi, Craig. Thanks for having me. And that we honestly, genuinely, viewers, this is the first time we've met. So this is fresh for everybody. Um, it's great to have you on board. Uh, one of a number of new, exciting arrangers that we've managed to um, get onto Choir Community. And I'll ask you a bit about that later on, but I'm going to take you right back. Okay. Back to the beginning, if I can. This is the question I ask everybody, and I think you knew you were going to have this. <laughs> so um, I'm interested, Dan, in your very earliest musical memory. Yeah, I did. I, I saw that you'd asked this in some other interviews, and I thought about it. And it's I, what I find hard of, like, sometimes with those really early memories, it's hard to separate the... I actually remember it from stories and photos and stuff, isn't it? So it's like, it's hard to think of what is actually a memory and what is just something that's always been told to me. But I think like, I've got this tape, this cassette tape of uh, me and my mum and my dad singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It's very adorable. <laughs> and I feel like I can sort of remember it, even though I don't know if I actually can. All right, that, that kind of counts, but I'm going to push you again. I'm going to maybe a yeah. bit later than that. Can you remember something else that had maybe yeah. a record that had an impression on you when you were young? A, a yeah. You heard, a musical experience somewhere in your life on holiday at school, something that yeah. made an impression? But there was lots of, yeah, there was lots of music around always at home. My, my parents were really big uh, music fans, and so there was lots and lots of stuff around. And we'd always listen to music in the car, so my mum would have like, madonna a lot of madonna tapes and stuff like that that she'd play in the car that i can really remember enjoying and singing along to um my dad would do a lot of singing as well around the house so i remember i still use some warm-up rounds with choirs that are things that like my mum and dad used to sing when i was younger so there's definitely like a lot of singing going on oh can, can you give us an example of one of those well the one i did the other day was one that my dad used to do that goes hey Ho, nobody home, meat nor drink nor money have I none, yet I would be very, very merry, hey, ho, and it just kind of repeats like that, and it's quite a good one to sort of stomp around the room to. <laughs> An old medieval round from... Uh, yeah, medieval Christ. rounds. My my dad loves a uh, medieval Christmas carol, that's what he always has going on at, uh, yeah. <laughs> at the festive time of year. It's good to go back to the... Uh, um... Uh, the traditions and um, Absolutely. the oldie oldie style we you know we love a gaudete in our choir oh yes which yeah is i love really it old isn't it we did one of those mm. uh fantastic well i know you have many many influences in your your music that you've um that you've uh, written and arranged it's quite an eclectic uh mix which is lovely so your parents had quite an influence on your early listening um, yeah definitely it was my my parents like I think you all get your first your first music always comes from the, or the people most immediately near to you isn't it so I, I sort of remember that there was like a there was my parents music taste which I enjoyed as a child and then as you get a little bit older you start finding your own stuff don't you which like my mum my mum my, my was used to listen to the Beatles who I am absolutely obsessed with and uh I uh they I sort of remember listening to, you know, Yellow Submarine and all that stuff and enjoying it. And then my, my a friend of mine, who was like a friend of the family, showing me things like I Am The Walrus. And that like blew me away. Like, whoa. So music can also be like kind of weird and silly as well. And that now, really... How old would you have been at that? that time when you came probably out. about eight or nine I think yeah. and, and and then I all of the kind of like weird psychedelic Beatles really got to me you know I, I loved all of that stuff um and then yeah going going forwards there was all there was like my, my cousin was a big musical influence on me as well in, in various different ways too so I think yeah lots of lots of different places uh, okay. Uh, okay and what what about school what about primary school um was there a teacher at primary school that uh discovered your musicality or encouraged it particularly or made an impression on you did you yeah you sing so, songs at a school assembly that made you know you thought oh I like that one or yeah we did all the classic uh all the classic primary school uh songs cauliflowers fluffy and cabbages green all yeah. the bangers like that <laughs> that's great um but yeah there was a particular primary school teacher his name was Mr Hyatt and he um was really into kind of music and drama and he would I remember there's one particular lesson that I remember him teaching and and uh he came in and he always used to play guitar and he came in and told us he did this whole lesson around 
everywhere you go, you always take the weather with you by Crowded House. I can't, is that, I can't remember what's the title of the song. It's probably it's a like bit. The Weather With You. Weather the with Weather you. With You. There you go. By Crowded House. Yeah. And and he taught a whole lesson about that, about the idea of metaphor. And I remember like my mind being blown of him singing that song and he got us all to sing it together. And then he said like, um, oh, and you know, when he's talking about bringing the weather with you, it sort of means like your feelings, not actual rain. And I was like, no way, <laughs> you can't do that. That's crazy. And it really, I think, opened my mind to like what language can do as well as what music can do. And I think that like, you know, I, I teach in a school now when I think that some teachers, particularly in my primary school, when I think back to that age, were a big founding sort of part of that, of the reason why I thought that was a great thing to do. Mm. Oh, fabulous. Um, I'm also going to ask you about the first time you were ever in a choir. Um, were you ever in a choir before? Yeah, I, I have a slightly weird, I think, perhaps um, choir history. As in, I did singing at primary school and I did lots of, um, you know, assembly singing and I do shows and things like that. But I don't think I was formally properly in a choir until I was about 25, I think, oh, probably. Right. <laughs> Whereas I think lots of people who go on and, and lead choirs and do arrangements and stuff like that have probably done it for a lot of their life. And to me, it was something I came to a lot later in life. And it was I sort of joined a choir because I wanted to try and learn how to sing, basically. And I wanted to do it in a way that felt a bit safe like I could melt you know blend into the background a little bit <laughs> so I joined a choir a lot later and absolutely loved it and sort of from the moment I I joined a choir I sort of haven't looked back really what sort of choir was that what music was that what music were you doing so I did when I first started teaching so I, I trained as a teacher and I first there was like a sort of a school choir where we sung we with like the sixth formers the the sort of teaching staff would get together and sing um like we we'd sing a bit some bits of classical some bits of musical theater some pop songs but it was in kind of four part harmony and there weren't that many people per part and so i found it really challenging yeah. um but loved it and then uh, i i then moved to bristol and in bristol one of the first things i did when i didn't really know anyone was like right i've quite enjoyed this whole singing thing so i'm going to look out for a community choir and i end up joining uh, riff raff which is one of the choirs i now lead um and yeah jo joining that and going oh I'll, I'll maybe i'll make some friends this way and yeah met lots of fantastic people but also really got the bug for singing and singing in a group and yeah have that was about sort of 12 years ago now or something so yeah haven't looked back yeah was there a particular song but were you a tenor or bass how, how did you fit into the so i was when i was in so i'm a tenor really but when yeah. i was in uh when i when i joined riff raff in um in in bristol i was there was only about five men so it was the classic thing of you know we all have this problem with all choirs don't we that there's like a million altos <laughs> um and uh and so i was told no you just got to sing the the bass parts because that's what the men have to do <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I, I sung the the bass parts, even though it's absolutely not my strongest part of my voice at all. But I think it really helped me actually, because it was like discovering the sort of lower bits that I can just about squeeze out if necessary. So you said something interesting there. You said I joined Riff Raff as a singer, mm. and as a choir which I ended up leading. Yeah. So was that the first choir you led, or, or was that how? Yeah. So I kind that, of. How, how did that happen? How did that come about? So I, I sort of like. Well, my, the way I got into teaching, my degree is in, is in music technology. So I've always been obsessed with music, um, really kind of, it's been a huge part of my life for my whole life, really, but not really singing and performing. That was something that's come a lot later. And so when I was kind of a teenager, when I was going to uni, I was one of those people who was like, I, I love music, but I'm going to be behind a glass at a mixing desk, you know, recording bands, uh, that kind of thing. That's my kind of safe role <laughs> that I want to do. And and um, and so I, I always enjoyed doing that. And so um, by kind of through doing it through my university course, discovering the kind of life of a sound engineer, those kind of late nights, a lot of working on your own, mixing stuff. And I realized kind of what I really like is something that involves a lot of people, which isn't really what being a sound engineer is like. Yeah. And uh, and teaching sort of appealed to me. And when I went into teaching, I sort of thought, well, 
do I want to, you know, I, I knew I wanted to teach music, but my degree was sound technology. So I hadn't learned music theory in particular. I hadn't learned a lot of the stuff that you would do if you'd have done a, a more traditional music degree. So I like knew how to set up a compressor and all that kind of stuff, but I didn't know at all how to like, you know, read music really, to be honest. Um, but I really wanted to be a music teacher. So I, I, I did a, a teacher training course in IT. And so my first year of teaching was as, as an IT teacher. Um, but I knew that I wanted to do music. And I was just kind of told, look, this is just do your thing, get qualified as a teacher, you'll get in there. Um, and so I, I did my, yeah, became qualified as a teacher, then got my first music teaching job just on a kind of someone took a punt on me, basically, which was which was fantastic, because I'd not uh not taught music before and managed to convince a school to let me come and lead their music department when they just opened up which was a bit terrifying yeah. and i basically realized i'm gonna have to absolutely cram <laughs> i'm gonna have to learn all of this stuff <laughs> so i had to do like um you know i i joined the choir i did lots of um uh like lots and lots of my own study like I started taking piano lessons and singing lessons myself I did all my music theory grades and then my piano and singing grades like with the students I was teaching to some extent and I, and I started groups in school like choir groups uh when not really knowing how to do it basically <laughs> so I'd, I'd go and take this choir group of like you know 10 kids it was a small school when I started and just kind of work out how that would work borrowing ideas from the other choirs I'd been to so so yeah I, I'd led some groups in school but uh but to sort of you know your question was then how had I led any other groups but yeah so just just kids really and sort of practicing that and that was a really nice um way to practice and work things out I suppose and get better as I was doing it so then when the opportunity came along to to look at leading an adult choir which was pretty terrifying idea but at least I felt like I'd done it a little bit with kids mm. and so I could then give it a try with some slightly more terrifying adults because they did know the person doing yeah. riffraff kind of say I'm off can did anybody else want to have a go did you push yourself forward or did they say dad you're the other man uh, no, it's very much the case of um, so Elaine, who runs uh, runs Riff Raff, um, basically have made lots of that. It's quite a big choir in Bristol and it's got multiple kind of branches. And she was running a couple of the branches and she wanted a new teacher to come and lead a couple of the other branches. And she just put this advert out on Facebook. And I sort of thought about it and like, can I do that? That seems absolutely terrifying. Um and having done choirs a bit at school and I'd, I'd done it probably at school for about six or seven years at that point and I was like I think I'm ready to have a go and I, and I just thought it sounded like a really fun thing to do so I I, uh, I applied and had to go and do an audition which is probably the most terrifying thing I've ever done in my life <laughs> because because <laughs> you have to like go and it can be you have to go and like work out whether you can do this thing and it was all a cappella, so nothing at a keyboard or anything like that. And it was just like, you know, teach these parts with just a score in front of you. And um, yeah, I didn't know if I could do it until I was there in front of everyone. So it was kind of, and you couldn't really oh, practice. Definitely. So it's just like a, let's see, and either it'll be a very public failure or it might be all right. <laughs> and luckily well, it was okay. It worked out fine. <laughs> and, yeah. um, so what, um, then you got to arranging. So how, what's the first song you remember arranging? So I, I do little bits and pieces for school choirs and like very much learning as I go and I do things and they they wouldn't be that great. So I'd have another go and stuff. And I think I doing my like learning music theory was a big part of my early music teaching careers. And that really helped me. I did all of my like the stuff that I think probably people generally do a lot earlier in their life, but all of the, you know, figured bass and all that kind of stuff. And while it's not exactly the same stuff, it was, yeah. it was really useful actually to Later. learn what part writing is like. Um, and yeah, so, and then when I joined Riff Raff, I, I did a couple of terms of teaching other people's arrangements. And then I was told, um, oh, do you want to have a go at arranging something yourself? And I got a bit of a crash course in what that might look like and what the kind of house style was of, of that choir. And um, yeah, there was a lot of like going backwards and forwards with the choir director, Elaine, which was brilliant. So she'd like, I think the first song I did was um, a song by a uh, first aid kit called Stay Gold. Uh, it's a lovely little kind of pop folk song. And I think we got up to, from me sending it back and forward to her, we got up to about draft 25, I think, before it was wow. finished. <laughs> that is meticulous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, but that was really useful. That was like... Me. 
learning how to do it definitely <laughs> wow what was number what was number one like <laughs> oh unlistenable i'm sure <laughs> fine i'm sure it was fine um yeah. and how did you come across choir community how, how, did, how did that work and what was your so, impression so over sort of time i've um since i started leading adult choirs which is probably about six seven years ago now perhaps I um I've just loved it I've I've had such a great time doing it and I've, I've, I've found some other groups I lead a um an all-male choir associated with Riff Raff called the Raff Pack which is great and um through and then a, a few other groups in Bristol as well and from taking on other choirs I've needed more arrangements basically <laughs> so I've been looking around particular for lower voice arrangements and was directed to choir community as a great resource for them because and I think this is this is the problem that you identify on um on the on the kind of about section of the website is there's loads of arrangements out there but in terms of the quality and the suitability for a community choir it's yeah. really really varied so i'd find when i started leading choirs in school and i wasn't quite um you know i wasn't wasn't doing my own arrangements yet i'd find things in books and they'd either be like really really hard or really easy yeah, yeah. or um the wrong number of parts or the wrong ranges or just silly things like they'd have verse one and verse two but they'd be really different from each other in a way that was unnecessary for that level of choir you know fair of mine yeah yeah and it's like oh don't start throwing in variation now <laughs> give yes. me some repetition yes. <laughs> and yes. just little things like that that i think that finding choir community um i think it uh had the same uh ideas that i had about what i wanted from my choirs which is something which is going to sound amazing um but is also going to be achievable from a group of amateur singers and it's going to be like not so fiddly in a way that it is going to take ages to get there, but also, um, uh, you know, it's going to, it's going to be rewarding and, and, and exciting to learn. And I think that like, it seems like the choir community sort of group of arrangers, it seems like a group of people who've all got that same mm -hmm. ethos about what a good choir arrangement is like, which is great. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. It's nice to know. That's definitely part of what we, what we believe in that. Anyway, what is it about Bristol, Dan? Um, it's an amazing place for community choirs, isn't it? I mean, we I know uh, Sam very well. I know Wendy Sargent very well. I know Natalie um, very well. And then there's you as well. And there's probably many more out there. What What is it about Bristol and singing? Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it seems to be, I seem to have, I, I moved to Bristol before I started any of this. So I think I've really lucked out in finding like, um, Samir, who is the um, director for St. George's, one of our big um, concert venues, mm -hmm. always says, he always starts his thing saying, Bristol has got more choirs per people than anywhere else in the UK. And he says, I don't have any evidence for that, but I'm just going to keep saying it. <laughs> and then it becomes true. <laughs> well, it's a good guess. because It's a good you know, guess, isn't it? It's a good guess. There seems to be an endless supply of people wanting to be in choirs because there's some really yeah. big choirs. There are some yeah. massive ones. It Gert really Gert Lush is uh, Gert Lush is absolutely huge. Yeah, yeah definitely huge really successful. Great sounds. And there's a few, there's a few group big, big groups like that, as well as loads of little ones for and like lots of niches from like folk and musical theatre. Obviously, Doug does a musical theatre choir who I know works well. yeah. with you as well. So there's 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 loads, and it's um it's a really lovely community actually. Just in the last year, we've started to have regular choir leader meetings where people get together and talk about you know what they're doing and try and work on joint projects and stuff and so it's felt really like it's starting to become a proper community of lots of choir leaders working together as well and yeah i think um just the, the amount of people singing in this city is crazy well, you, you can tell them all your arrangements are now available on choir community oh i i certainly will and have been already <laughs> the, dan, the dan pate collection um so we've got a wonderful uh collection of yours a very eclectic so you've got some Kate Bush, you've got Foo Fighters, you've got Oasis there. So out of all those arrangements, which one is your personal favourite? Oh, that's a tough question. I know, but you've got to answer it. <laughs> 
I trying to it's hard because you get a bit of recency bias don't you but the Kate Bush one you mentioned was one I did relatively recently and I really loved that's um, cloud busting yeah that. cloud busting yeah it was done because we had a competition in one of my choirs a, a fancy dress competition <laughs> we had to dress up okay. <laughs> you know we like to do these things and um the winner got to pick a song and that was the song they chose was cloud busting and I love Kate Bush so I was kind of I jumped at the chance to to do that arrangement and it's just such a beautiful song and I I love the like I enjoyed the challenge of the the original song is quite loop based it's quite like you know it's quite electronic and it's got all the, the like fair light sampler and stuff and so it doesn't necessarily immediately lend itself to a obvious choir arrangement so I guess it involved me thinking a bit creatively about how am I going to get the rhythmic drive of the original mm -hmm. but not make it too boring so like in the verses I, I include a bit of you know the dum 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 dum, dum sort of like string things but then it kind yeah. of opens up into into um more kind of lyrical chorus and stuff and yeah it's That's got some lovely they definitely had this element of real crafting with the moving things around mm. um the, around the choir you know a little mm. bit here a little bit there so yeah i think that's really important because um, if you if you you know from from singing in choirs myself, if you end up in the the whole song, you're just doing accompaniment parts. Doing it could be really na, 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 na. exactly. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I'm probably guilty guilty of that a couple of times. Well, we all do it sometimes, don't we? But I tr I really try and make sure that all the parts are interesting and 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 just sort of little things that um I've started doing recently, like instead of using dum dum dum, using some of the lyrics from the song as like accompaniment yeah. words and stuff, and that can yeah people would notice that I've, I've been using that little technique for quite a while as well. So mm. again, we agree on an ethos there. Is there mm. anything else that's part of your arranging ethos that you like? And do you uh, come to every song afresh or, um, or do you have some, uh, some tenets that you hold on to that you, that you try and adhere to when you arrange a song? Um, um, I guess it's approach. Yeah, I suppose like, you know, you want to you want to make it people love people will want to enjoy doing the original song. So to some extent, you want to capture the, the 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 feeling of the original. But yeah. I always feel like I don't want to be stuck too much to trying to accurately recreate it. I think that sometimes that can be an an acapella because uh, because my arrangements are broadly a cappella, and sometimes it can be a a kind of thing of how can I make this exact song but just with voices. And while there's some real fun to that, like singing a guitar solo, also I think it's more about I think I try and approach mine with more of the flavour of the original, That's but good. trying to adapt it to yeah to to be an to be an entertaining and fun thing to sing. Um, but you know you want to keep the vocal the the melody lines the same. You want to retain that the the karaoke element of what people like about it. But also like I, I think one of the things I really enjoy is creating new little harmony lines that maybe aren't there in the, in the original, but will will add a, a kind of a new something to the song. Yeah, that's something Gitika uh, does very well as well. In, mm, uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, look listeners and watchers uh the evidence is all there for you to see go to see go to dan's arrangement page and you can look at the arrangements while you listen to them and the evidence is there that everything he says is true and worth, <laughs> and, <so. laughs> and worth, worth checking out before we go is there one more song that you haven't arranged that you would like to have a go at maybe in the future that you can tantalize us with yeah, so what and the uh, song I'm working on at the moment, I've just started today actually, is uh, Never Too Much by Luther Vandross. Bit of a soul classic to get everyone kind of moving and moving around a bit while singing as well. Yes, I noticed your yes, the, the rhythms that you put into the to the parts um, are very important to you. They drive it for. I think you'll need that in that one, won't you? Probably. Oh yeah, definitely. You want to like yeah, that's definitely a challenge of making it a bit groovy. Is uh, but also making it possible to sing <laughs> those are the, those are the okay. two things you're fighting against with the really funky stuff but it's good it's fun. all happening in in the dan pate library so amazing to meet you and i hope we get to see each other very soon Absolutely. and we look forward to some incredible uh, contributions from you in, on choir community and good luck with all your choirs for 2024 thank you thanks craig thanks a lot it's really exciting to be part of the choir community family yeah you're so welcome and uh, we'll get to see you soon. Take yeah. care. See you soon. Thank you. Bye.